COVID should have made us realize the role that diet played in people's susceptibility to the disease. Um, we, it, it's kind of most, of most of all the discussions globally have talked about the underlying conditions that make people, I think, susceptible um, and, 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 prove, and, and make the disease prove more lethal. And they're often, they, they stop because they don't wanna say it's diabetes, it's hypertension, it's obesity, all the things that are associated with chronic diet related illnesses. This should be a powerful moment to talk about, at least in the States, the standard American diet, um, how we grow our food, uh, who, how much we pay the people who pick our food and the people who serve our food. This should open the doorway to huge discussions about senior meals, prison meals, military, seniors. Um, yet, yet, tragically, I think sometimes the, the nonprofit sector that I love and adore just kind of wants it to stay the same as, as it ever was. <laughs> Robert Egger is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Robert is the founder of the DC Central Kitchen, the Campus Kitchen Project, and the LA Kitchen, which have collectively produced over 40 million meals and helped over 2,000 individuals attain jobs. In Washington, he was a founding chair of the Mayor's Commission on Nutrition and Street Sense, Washington's homeless new newspaper. In addition, he is a founding board member of the World Central Kitchen with Jose Andreas. Robert was also the co-convener of the first nonprofit Congress and founder of the CF Ford PAC, which worked to help elect people who ran nonprofits. He also wrote an award-winning book, Begging for Change. Robert is an international speaker, and he has received dozens of awards over the years for his ideas and work, including being named a Point of Light and Oprah Angel Humanitarian of the Year Awards by the James Beard Foundation and a Washington, uh, Washingtonian of the Year he was also only direct uh, service provider to appear on the nonprofit times list, the most powerful and influential nonprofit leaders from 2006 to 2009. And last but not least, Robert is a 15 gallon blood donor with the American Red Cross. He has a long list. He's been doing this 30 plus years and he's been around the block. And is really, uh, I could go on for days with the accolade, accolades and the humanitarian service he's done uh, and made into his life's work. I'm so glad to have you here, Robert. Thank you for being on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you, Mark. Man, it's a pleasure, a real pleasure. Uh, brother, it's good to have you, and I'm glad we can have this discussion and, and, and take the time just to talk and remove some bias and get into sense making. Um, as I mentioned, we could probably go on days just about all the things you've done over these 30 years and, and what you've accomplished and, and really the lives that you've touched, not just the meals you've delivered, the jobs you've provided, the people you've helped make a transition out of some pretty rough situations into better and how you kind of just fell into this uh, originally wanted to be kind of a, a nightclub owner and, and just kind of real, really be a... a a, a superstar in, in a different sense. And you, you came upon this opportunity that's really uh, changed your entire life. And what I love the most is you, you've really put your own personal feelings of history, music, and just a lot of fun, fucking shit up, so to say, uh, which is also one of your websites, mm -hmm. just, just having a lot of fun making some mistakes, but also have a lot of learning lessons. And, and, and it's really worked out well for you for a long time. With all that being said, we've just experienced the most brutal, crazy time ever, not just uh, uh, the, the pandemic and, and Black Lives Matters and the inauguration and the Brexits and, and any other craziness going on around the world uh, that, that's happened. And um, 
how have you weathered all this? How have you been with all that experience? Did you have some resilience to, to make it through there? Or did you uh, see some things that, that were all, some new learning lessons over this time? Oh, brother, you know, you know um, A, before we get started, um, I really appreciate and respect being referred to as a humanitarian, but I'm, I, I think that word, I appreciate it and I understand it, but I'm more of a, a nutritional activist. Um, you know, I'm a real big believer in kind of liberation theology, you know, um, I've said many times, but, you know, charity, the field I love, but it's so often based on uh, the redemption of the giver. And I'm a big believer in the liberation of the receiver. So a lot of the work I do is much more bold and challenging than, you know, kind of the, the good deeds oftentimes associated, the essential good deeds associated with humanitarian. I'm, I'm more of a, 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 a squeaky wheel, you know, a, a, a bad mofo who demands um, and challenges the status quo of this system. So, yeah, man, the, the, I think COVID, I'll give you a good example. COVID should have made us realize the role that diet played in people's susceptibility to the disease. Um, we, it, it, it's kind of most, of most of all the discussions globally have talked about the underlying conditions that make people, I think, susceptible um, and, 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 prove, and, and, and make the disease prove more lethal. And they're often, they, they stop because they don't wanna say it's diabetes, it's hypertension, it's obesity, all the things that are associated with chronic diet related illnesses. This should be a powerful moment to talk about, at least in the States, the standard American diet, um, how we grow our food, uh, who, how much we pay the people who pick our food and the people who serve our food. This should open the doorway to huge discussions about senior meals, prison meals, military, seniors. Um, yet, yet, tragically, I think sometimes the, the nonprofit sector that I love and adore just kind of wants it to stay the same as, as it ever was. And to a certain extent, to be quite blunt, to um, almost, uh, you know, kind of la, 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 not pretend that we don't have a role to play after decades of kind of pushing processed junk food down the system onto the poor, poisoning the poor in the name of feeding them. This should be a moment where we stop and say, you know what, man, never again, never again. Here's the new nutritional bar that we will never cross. We will never poison a person in the name of feeding them. And more importantly, we'll amp up our advocacy so that charity isn't the baseline for how we serve our fellow citizens. That's one of many conversations. I love that. That was so vital and important. And, and I knew that you, you, you would mention that. That's exactly where we need to go. It's not just about the, the charity aspect and feeding people. It's about transforming their lives with healthy food, with different skills, with different options that eventually they can get into a different situation and also have the, the resilience or the, the, the health to, to fight some of these crazy things that are coming down the pipeline, whether they're, they're um, diseases or, or, or uh, pandemics or actually just the, the simple societal things that we're, we've been dealing with political as well. We'll, we'll kind of get into that a little bit later because there there's an aspect that I think that uh, some realities I'd like you to kind of give our listeners about how they look at uh, what central kitchens do and, and what you've done in the past, because I think some of them don't understand, but you, you guys get pretty damn political and you, you don't put up with a lot in the type of people that, that are in, in uh, coming in to help volunteer or work or to, 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 give you the food and, and what you do um, have some pretty rough backgrounds and they, they also generate a certain amount of economy. And so we're going to touch on that, but I wanted to let my viewers first and foremost know we met through a mutual friend, Diane Hatz of mine uh, does change food, wonderful person. Um, and I just barely a couple of days ago on that uh, was on Saturday had uh, Dr. Katie Martin, who is the head of the uh, Connecticut uh, Food Bank and, and um, the, does a lot around food banks, she just wrote a book called Reinventing Food Banks and Pantries. It's, it's very rare in, in that air industry to find, first of all, good books that kind of talk about similar things which you've talked about in the past. And I believe there's even a little mention in, in, in her book about you. Yeah, I don't know if uh, you, you've, you heard about that. 
But it's really interesting because it's, it's hard to find materials like this around uh, uh, food banks and pantries. But I wanted, I was hoping that you could give us the distinguishment or the help, help us, uh, help my listeners understand what's the difference between a central kitchen, uh, LA kitchen, DC kitchen, world central kitchen, and food banks and food pantries and, and what roles do they play and how, how, how does that whole process work? That would be, I mean, we, we need to first get up to the same speed of what you're talking about so we can understand where and what they are. So if you could help great. us there, that'd be great. Sure. Now, you know, what's interesting is, you know, I've carried a little bit of a, 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 a Jones, for lack of a better word, about food banks for a long time. Because again, I've, I've been frustrated uh, along with other people I have tried, you know, with love to offer ideas about the kind of um, metrics, for example. The, the entire system has historically been based on two incredibly, in my opinion, flawed metrics of success. And those metrics have influenced generations of donors, politicians to believe that pounds move, the amount of weight of food you move out, or the number of agencies you serve more being good are benchmarks for impact and they're not in fact they they can oftentimes seduce people into moving whatever they can get their hands on to account for more weight because they condition donors to believe that only if you move more than you did last year are you good you know you have to keep moving more and more and more and that led i think a one generation of food bankers to um as uh, uh, uh you know kind of get bigger and bigger and bigger versus really stop and again think about nutrition think about you know a political activism and more importantly the idea of and I, there is a dignity factor but you know kind of the whole system because you have those food banks and before i i, I go from there i really want to honor uh your previous guest because i have to remember constantly there is a new generation of food bankers coming up who are just as interested as i am in change and i think sometimes those of us who get older can constantly frame and oftentimes carry junk on their back because of a past slight or a sense of those people don't care anymore and you can lose yourself. In fact, uh, it, you know, years ago, I got this little tattoo on my finger here of a heart because it can be tempting sometimes to do this too much, you know, and I, I, I have that to constantly remind myself, you know, don't be a jerk, dude. Don't, don't act superior. Don't think you're smarter. Understand that it's, it's a common human trait to get lost in your system, to get lost in your program and to um, defend it uh, and, and, and all that. So again, mad props for, uh, and I'm looking forward to reading that book because. Yeah, it just barely came out, Dr. Katie Martin. And um, the, the great thing about it is, is her model, just so you know a little bit more, her model is really that one of turning food banks into uh, almost like a food bank, a whole foods food bank type of a thing, a, a market where people can go out and pick out their own food, that there's a lot of healthy and nutritious food in there, and that it's not just handing out food, it's actually support services to transition them into other, you know, how how can they get onto SNAP, uh, how, WIC, or how can they get onto a different system that helps them um, kind of get, get get out of the the food pantry food bank area to need those services at all and and she also mentioned you know in this covid it's really had a huge impact on how much food people need people never in their life would have thought they needed food uh and now they lost their job they uh the situation was such that all of a sudden they found themselves being in that position and what the the terminology or the lexicon of words that we use uh, in that area can just be enough for someone to go or not go or to say, oh, I'm not, I'm not somebody who needs that, but they actually are. Well, you know, in my personal career, I've tried to use this personal kind of metric of 4951. 49% of my time, 49% of my time is always dedicated to whatever business I'm running, DC Kitchen, LA Kitchen, whatever, trying to make it better, faster, more efficient, more effective, more liberating. But it that 49% has to be in service to a bigger cause of 51%. The, you know, I, I have to be serving a bigger movement than just my own business. Now, if you reverse that and it becomes 51% my business, 49% cause, I think you're lost because you'll always be feeding your little beast. 
And I'm not interested in that. You know, it, it, what am I part of? What's, what are we trying to do collectively? So I'll give you an example. While it is exciting to hear food banks and pantries talk about, you know, kind of the, the whole foods dignity side, $15 minimum wage. You know, what are we doing on behalf of making people uh, be able to buy their own food? You know, I'm always fascinated by the idea of the co-op model. I mean, we historically think poor people need free things versus saying, no, are you kidding? McDonald's, Walmart, all these companies make tons of money off poor people. Why don't we offer a revenue model in which they can buy stuff? And that raises the responsibility. When, you, when, you, when you're giving people free food, it's baked in that you have, there's a power dynamic. I'm giving you free food, come back tomorrow, I'll give you more. That's redemption of the giver. Um, liberation of the receiver is why don't we create a co-op model in which you're a part owner um, and we'll work from there. So again, there's that, there's that sense of trying to tinker around the edges of a system that is still based on come to me and stand in my line. And what I find awkward is the way we oftentimes segment people to get services. So for example, we oftentimes will say, if you're old, you go over there to that line. If you're a child, you go over to the, that line. If you want to self-identify as a poor worker, you can stand in this line. And I must admit, it's I've become more and more intrigued by um, community meals and the idea of everyone eating together. And this is another, should be a byproduct of COVID. You know, instead of the kind of understandable, but kind of fundraising um, vo vocabulary of, you know, they used to be the donors, now they're the clients. It should have been a clarion call of saying, you know, maybe the power of fighting hunger is, is the more powerful ally in hunger is community, um, not charity. And how can we put people together in this, in this moment where a lot of economic lines have been erased? You know, people who used to be middle class now suddenly come to the food bank. Wouldn't it be great to put them together? And if I may, Mark, I'm sorry, man, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a talker here, but an even more powerful opportunity is if I could do anything right now, um, I would be fascinated to work on creating an intergenerational political alliance around food. Food is such a unifying tool. It's too often, I think, food banks and pantries view it as gas for the human body. You know, come here and fill up versus that idea, no, come here and let's plot. You know, that idea of let's start to talk about politics and how can we elect a generation of people who view food as an essential right who view nonprofits as essential economic partners. These are the kind of things that will diminish the need for charity and elevate, I think, the power of community. Absolutely, and you can never talk enough. I, I, I wanna go deep, I wanna bring out these things. And, and we, I mean, we could really talk for hours because there's so many, that we've picked one of the, the, the biggest topics of life. And, and, and so there, there are so many things that we can touch upon. Today is International Women's Day, and there is a big role that women play in, in kitchens and in this whole movement of creating food, which is, um, I've heard you say it before, but I really want to go back to your words as well, that not only it's an essential part of the economy, which is kind of funny because originally women who now get in the workforce or get this empowerment to be part of it. They're like, oh, well, you can only do these certain types of things. And they did it so damn well that now that, you know, they've, they've created this uh, huge uh, economy almost that's equivalent to the size of India. You know, it's this sector of what they do. They do it so well and they've proven how, how, how successful that it can be. And, and that's another thing that you really discuss as well. You, you have this, saying that says there is no profit without nonprofit, and and um there's there's so much that ties into that but i was kind of wondering if you can give us a, a little journey or enlighten us on how the big part that women play in, in this movement and and what things are kind of been suppressed and what are really coming to light well hey I, I really wish your audience would stop for a second and really take in that that economic principle there's no profits without nonprofits. Um, because if you really look hard, no matter where you go in the world, if you don't have arts and culture, communities of faith, healthcare, education, clean air, clean water, all the things nonprofits provide, um, you don't have a local economy. There's no vibrancy to a town, you know? So I've always hoped that we would own that economic principle or at least push it harder. 
But, um, you know, there's an interesting kind of uh, uh, parallel in that, not only it International Women's Day, but, you know, it was just a couple of years ago that we had, at least in the States, kind of a, a real record-breaking election of women into uh, political office. And there was a lot of celebration, yet it took a hundred years from the 19th Amendment that gave women, white women, the right to vote to get these kind of numbers. And that begs a big question, right? So, you know, I, I've always tried, I, I tend to be a, an amateur futurist and work on probability, women outlive men, women outnumber men. What does that look like? And we can get to that. But I, I became fascinated on, on the fact that here was the nonprofit sector in America that has so much political, I mean, so much economic, such an economic role to play, yet doesn't have uh, an equal economic or political role to play. You know, we don't have, for example, access to capital the way the traditional businesses do, male, the male dominated business sector, the dot com world in the States. Um, you know, they have, they can get loans, all kinds of different access to capital. We have to rattle a cup and hope a rich person um, gives us some money. And I've pointed out many times, even though God bless Bill Gates and Warren Buffett with the giving pledge, it's still based on this idea of make as much money in your life as you can by any means necessary. And somewhere near the end of your life, give a little bit back to offset the damage you did. It's never designed to work. So that idea that we are funded through that system in itself is kind of economic sexism. It's, it basically says, if you are subservient and quiet and you feed the poor, we'll give you a grant. But there's no money for political activism, no more, no money for economics, no money for voter. Re uh, well, there's a little bit of money for voter registration. I take that back. But as I found uh, when I really tried to organize kind of a pack saying, hey, what would it be like if we actually elected more and more people who actually ran nonprofits? So at least, at least we had people who understood our role involved in the legislative process. Um, so, but you know, when you look at the role of women in the American workplace in, in the late 1950s, there was, women were about 19% of the workforce. And over the next 35 years, they grew into almost 49%, 50% of the American workforce. At the same time, the nonprofit sector went from about 60,000 charities to almost 1.4 million and a $3 trillion in assets, 360 billion in annual revenue, 14 million employees, 60 million volunteers. And again, you can't make profit without us. So there is, I believe, a me too moment in the ascent of the nonprofit sector in which the women who make up 70% of the founders, the volunteers, the workers are women. This is the feminized part of the American economy. And I believe only, only when our sector owns its history, owns its power, owns its economics and owns its political role, will we move beyond mere charity and see a door opening to a much more vibrant, deeper, more interesting and more liberating time, not just in America, but globally. Uh, I totally agree, and, and you say it so eloquently, and it tie it all together. Um, <clears throat> can you give us a little bit more insight on what you've seen in the past, the type of employees and volunteers and people you have um, come and work at the central kitchens, and um, e even more so, where does that food go? Who's it for? Uh, kind of a little bit more explanation, because I think... It wasn't until uh, Jose really that even more awareness uh, around this for, for many people around the world was happening. And um, he got the uh, Julia Child Award and many other awards as well at that, that they're like saying, what is this World Central Kitchen and that? Can you give us more insight uh, on, on that as well? Well, you know, yes, and, and there's the what we do, but then there's the why, and we'll get into the why a little bit later, but the, it, it is important to give your audience, your listeners, some sense of, you know, what is this model? Now, just so you know, again, you mentioned earlier, I ran nightclubs, and my idea for a nightclub is the, the kind of Trojan horse that music, theater, comedy, dance can be. You know, not unlike food, I, I, I alluded earlier that too many people in my movement, in this movement view food is gas for the body. Similarly, um, many people view music and that stuff as candy for the ear. I'm more interested in the fact that when I was coming up uh, and a child in the 1960s, I was 10. 
1968, when Dr. King was murdered, Robert Kennedy was assassinated, murdered. Um, Cesar Chavez, who was um, uh, uh, working, doing a 25 day fast uh, to raise awareness about the, the plight of migrant workers. So I saw, you know, so many interesting people. I mean, again, when I was a kid, Malcolm X, Gloria Steinem, uh, Shirley Chisholm, um, they were just amazing leaders. And so I kind of um, self-baptized very early in the kind of the, I, I chose my side very early. But again, what I witnessed was how speeches and talks tended to make people fearful, right? And I was interested in, okay, these ideas must carry on. Just because they've killed the leaders doesn't mean the idea has to stop. There's that old, in fact, it's years ago, I went to Martin Luther King's, uh, the assassination of the Lorraine Motel where he was assassinated. And before they built a giant uh, uh, um, kind of civil rights museum around it, there was a very simple plaque right where he lay that said, lo, here comes the dreamer, let us slay him and see what becomes of his dream. And that idea for me is what becomes of the dream? But I, again, as I said, I, I was aware of how people were so fearful of political ideas, yet um, I was actually, my parents had a party and my dad put on some Motown records and everybody danced. People who might've been fearful of the ideas of women's liberation, migrant workers, civil rights, were dancing to ideas that were basically civil rights ideas put to music. And I became fascinated by that idea of like, wow, I mean, they, they don't like it over here, but they'll listen to it over here, maybe long enough to hear a new idea. So that was my intent. I was gonna open the greatest nightclub in the world. I left um, you know, high school, didn't go to college. My college was nightclubs. And I came up in a very glorious time. I mean, you know, I was in the music world from the you know the mid 70s when you know punk rock and and then 70 79 80 when the the glory of the world the tableau of global music opened up and suddenly it was like you know king sunny a day um you know and all the music of africa so, you know it's just it was a mind-blowing time to be you know craft work suddenly comes out with electronic music uh, brian eno i mean it was just it was a breathtaking time so here I was enjoying life, planning, plotting to open the world's greatest nightclub, yet simultaneously, homelessness became more and more and more visible, prominent, um, and, and, and more visceral in that, at least in Washington, D.C., where I lived, here were people in front of the White House, behind the White House, all up and down the ellipse. Anybody who's been to Washington, D.C., or sadly, almost any city in the world now, sees homeless people everywhere. And like most people, I was empathetic, but I, I felt it was someone else's job. I mean, I ran nightclubs and all that. But this is why I oftentimes refer to myself as a recovering hypocrite, because um, I had talked eloquently about changing the world with music and theater and art, blah, blah, blah. Yet when I was asked, did I want to go out and serve homeless people in my own backyard, I looked for every excuse to get out of it. You know, I was young and I was afraid. I mean, I think too often we're afraid to acknowledge that we all have bigotries and we're all, we all have fears. And I allowed the image of the homeless to keep me at bay, you know? So I looked for every excuse not to go out to feed the poor one night, ended up going. And two things happened. Um, it was raining. So here we were serving people outside in the rain, but we were also serving them food purchased from one of the most expensive stores in Washington, DC. And I'm just minding my own business, just trying to get through this night. But it was this nagging moment on which there was this kind of duality of saying, wow, they're buying food. But I know uh, restaurants, hotels, caterers, farmers, our American food system relies on. There's a huge amount of waste baked into our kind of economic plan. You know, every time you buy a meal, part of the cost of that meal covers stuff that didn't get, you know, didn't make it out. So I thought, wow, I mean, you, know, you could, if you could get that food, and bring it to a central kitchen, you could feed more people better food for less money. So there was an economic aspect of, well, there's a cheaper, faster, better way to do this. And I, I respect what they're doing, but, but more importantly was that, that going back to that idea of here I was in a warm truck serving people outside in the rain. And I just felt like I'm the one who's being served here. You know, I, I think this system rewards me with the great sense of I've done a great deed, you know, I can go home and sin relentlessly now for 24 hours because I got a, you know, I got a, a pass. 
but it, it, it almost mandated that somebody be outside the truck in the rain for me to be able to do that. And I just also thought, look, restaurants have all this food, but they also have jobs. Wouldn't it be interesting to create a central kitchen, but a cooking school so that men and women can come off the street and be part of the solution versus perennial recipients of well-intended charity. As Morrissey once sang, um, you know, they were, they were hostages to kindness. Uh, and uh, that idea of saying there's got to be a way in which both sides can be liberated simultaneously. As I've said in earlier, you know, about the redemption of the giver, I'm, I'm a sinner, dude. I need all the redemption I can get. I just refuse to do it at the expense of another human being. If you could create a system in which both sides were redeemed simultaneously, you know, wouldn't that be great? Now, you know, I was just a, a, a nightclub guy just trying to help. I was a volunteer who wanted to help. Yet every charity I went to, including the local food bank in DC and all the other groups I went to, um, seemed hell bent on trying to shoot down this idea. And I'm like, dudes, I'm just trying to help. I'm a volunteer. But again, this is cheaper, faster, better. And you're going to shorten the line by the very way you serve it. How can you not want to try this? And it was kind of ridiculous. It got to the point where, you know, people said, oh, restaurants won't hire addicts or people out of prison. And it's like, dudes, you've never worked in a kitchen in a restaurant. I mean, it is an island of misfit toys, you know, but that's when I realized that the, the charities that I assumed would have a by any means necessary culture didn't. Uh, and they were so wed to their model that they couldn't see past it. In fact, they were so wed to it that they were going to resist and fight against innovation. So A, I launched DC Kitchen because no one else would. But when I launched it, I swore, and it's been a, a massive part of my journey is how do I never become those people? How do I become, how do I avoid that trap of saying no? When, and so again, I became a fierce advocate of yes. Anyway, to, to really dig in here, and I, I'm sorry for the long-winded. No, of you're fine. I'm glad we're, we're getting it. That's beautiful. But the kitchen was saying, look, restaurants, you hate throwing away food. Restaurateurs hate throwing away food. They just don't want to be sued. So, and what was interesting is there was an urban myth that it was illegal to donate food. I heard this all the time. There's never been a law anywhere in the United States, at least, that prevented the donation of food. In fact, quite the opposite. Even though they were patchworked uh, at the time in the late 1980s, um, most states had some kind of a law that said, unless you're really trying to hurt somebody, it's gross negligence or malicious intent, you won't be held liable if somebody gets sick if you donate food to a charity. So, you know, the restaurants were pretty easy. They were excited because, and my pitch was always kind of business. It was saying, I'll give you a tax deduction for the folk. Uh, I, I will give you um, a, a receipt for the weight that, of food you donated to me. And then you and your accountant can figure out if there's a tax deduction for you. But we'll also decrease the amount of, um, uh, of pest control, the amount of waste uh, management you have to hire to come in and haul your trash away. There'll be a morale boost for your staff who will feel like now they're not just throwing away good food every day. And more importantly, I'll take that food and I'll train somebody for a job and I'll get them to the point where they're a certified food handler. They can show up on time and they have good knife skills. And then you can do the rest. And for most employers, it was like, dude, just give me somebody who shows up on time. I'll, I'll figure out the rest. But it was a good piece of business. Most restaurateurs were like, Dude, I give you food. You give me. A, you give me a worker. Life is good. Let's do business. Um, but again, that idea of saying, you know, a who is most in need of those jobs, you know. So when I started, I worked with the homeless primarily. But when you open that doorway, you know, you realize homelessness is a fancy word we use to avoid discussions about prison, um, a wage, housing, racism, drug abuse, all kinds of things. So, um, you know, it began this, this journey of, 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 of showing people the real power of food, you know, all the different things food could do um, to make society better. Now that in turn generated a huge amount of volunteer interest because, you know, again, I opened up, I use my showbiz flair, but we opened up on inauguration day uh, for George Bush senior, January 20th, 1989 was kind of our official opening day. Now again, dude, Media 101. I mean, you know, what media outlet in the world could resist food from the inauguration going to poor people the next day? So it, it, it generated a huge amount of interest. 
But this is another big important moment because I realized, you know, I'm sitting here in the nation's capital and I've got access to the president and all these parties and media. And of course, this grew as the 90s unfolded and you had cable television, the internet. So I really decided very early that I would be selfish and wrong to absorb all that light, you know? And I decided that the DC kitchen was gonna be a reflector to a larger movement. That my, whenever somebody came and they came all the time, volunteers, media, politicians, it was, my, my mantra was gonna be, I am one of many. You know, I, I represent a movement of more and more and more people who wanna really explore the power of food, not just a, a warehouse to redistribute food. And so that attracted an enormous amount of, of volunteers. And, and I became aware that if I could bring people into the kitchen, knowing that like I was, that first time I volunteered, I never let go of that idea of A, I was a volunteer, B, I was a volunteer who offered ideas and was rebuffed. So that idea of really showing deep respect for volunteers, you're giving me part of your day. I'm, I'm, we're obligated, I'm obligated to be respectful of your time and your contribution. But like any good nightclub or any good business person, you know your best advertisers are happy customers. So we embrace this idea we called the calculated epiphany. And it was based on this idea that if we set the stage knowing that most people walk in thinking, I'm gonna go into one of the biggest homeless shelters in America, which is where DC Kitchen was um, really growing. It was right below the capital of the United States. And most people, if you say, come to the biggest shelter, come around back, it's in the basement, we're gonna be doing 4,000 meals made with leftover food and training homeless people for jobs. Most people's imaginations go wild with images that are negative, you know, um, homeless people with knives, you know, big pots of, of, of gruel, um, you know, dirty, disorganized, because it's a nonprofit. And so what we decided is if we were really subtle and diabolical, quite honestly, we could lure people in with this kind of sense of come help us feed the poor. But once they walked in and they would say, and this was all the way from presidents to like fourth graders, you know, everyone walked in and they were like, wow, this is really, you know, this is super clean, super organized. Look at the quality of the food. I'm sitting here next to someone who did time in prison that I would normally be terrified. Yet we're having this great conversation while we together side by side cook a meal for the community. And that was a big part of our model was side by side, you know, that idea of President of the United States and the Obamas and the Clintons were regular volunteers. The idea that someone who might have spent 20 or more years in prison and may have at times considered ending their life. You know, I got 10 more years left on my sentence. I can't do it, you know, but they did it. And here they are through some bizarre twist of fate standing next to the President of the United States. And for the pro predominantly Afri African-American men and women who went through DC Kitchen, that idea of here's the first African-American president and here I am standing telling the president how to do this. You know, to me, that was the real power and the kind of, if you will, the nightclub edge of what I was doing was because anytime a president or somebody came, here was all the media in the world and that power of showing someone who's in prison guiding the president of the United States, one of the smartest people around, guiding them through this, gently, lovingly helping the president contribute to the city we shared. Dude, you know, that's to me, that's the kind of subtle, um, that's, it's almost, remember I, I, I alluded to earlier, the power of music. That's a love song. You know, that's like one of those great love songs that every time it comes on the radio, you swoon or you grab your lover's hand, you know? That's what I wanted to do. I want people to, when they saw that, that, to me, that was a social lyric. You know, that idea of the president and someone from prison working side by side as citizens of a shared city. To me, that was poetry in motion, you know? And that was a faster way I felt to change people's minds than uh, spouting, you know, kind of statistics about who's hungry and why. Such a beautiful story, and I, I can see, I can feel it when I hear it. You know, and that's really 
tells the listeners how you know what what is a central kitchen what is uh what is the you know the dc central kitchen and and later you really went on to to many more um kitchens and and collaborations and sit on the boards and advisory because there is this model it's a model that um your mantra there is no profit without nonprofit. it's a better operating system it's a better business model it's a, a smarter way to um run an organization and um i would suggest for anybody um that is listening to this to go to your old website or your new website look up your youtube you have hundreds of different videos and most of them you're standing right there in the kitchen and I know exactly what you're what you meant when you say you know when people have this vision uh, if they've never been to a central kitchen before uh, run or run with homeless people or people from jail and these uh, God knows what they imagine you know it's uh, these horrific visions but not one of them is like that it's a very clean very fun atmosphere a lot of um, good noise, positive, upbeat noise, people uh, dress nice, looking clean, making fabulous food. Well, just some of them, when I look in the background, I'm like, oh man, that looks delicious. Um, and it's coming from a kitchen feeding people who, who need it. And um, yeah. yeah, and so- Let's go so, with this. You know, because, yeah, um, you know, baked in there was also this idea of, of radical no waste no waste everything you know the idea of i'm going to squeeze every ounce of opportunity out of every morsel of food i get and that led to um you know and again that that fierce sense of i'm never going to get set in my ways and calcify so that that constant um hunt just as a nightclub person would always be listening for that new sound you know where's that new sound that i need to know about and understanding that oftentimes growing up, some of the sounds that I became most enamored by were ones that were so foreign that they turned me off at first. It's like, ah, I can't, you know, that's, that makes no sense to me. But the deeper you listen, the more you're like, oh, I get it now. So that idea of constantly looking, and this led to Campus Kitchens, which was saying, um, this began in the 1990s when we started the mandate that every kid in American schools did some form of service to graduate, right? It became a prerequisite. Now, most of it was mandated and most students just, okay, whatever, I'm just gonna go to my hours. But it's like, wow, you know, but the model still said, again, come to me, come to my kitchen and I will give you the, you know, you can get your service hours here. Well, one day I was in rural Indiana um, and through windshields, my, 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 it was raining and through windshield wipers, I'm looking and there was this brand new high school in this little town where my parents retired. And it's like, there's a brand new school and there's a brand new cafeteria kitchen in there. And every kid's got to do service. What would it be like if instead of saying, come to my kitchen, I went to their kitchen. And that reverse flow of saying, wow, there's 50,000 school cafeterias in America. And as the um, cable television kind of introduced the idea of the celebrity chef and more culinary schools were opening and more people were excited by food you know, that idea of saying, wow, what a doorway right on campus. And not just in a high school, but imagine a university where you have, instead of trying to say to a, a medical student, come and volunteer and spend one day chopping carrots versus saying, you're a medical student. You know, I want your brain. I, you know, I, you, anybody can chop a carrot. I want you to help me think about what we can do with the carrot. So that idea of the reverse flow and, and saying, let's go right onto college campuses. And maybe we can look at, and, and this one day, again, so many of my ideas have been born on these kind of spontaneous moments, but here I was looking at this new school thinking, not only is there a cafeteria, but there's a big field behind there. You could do an after-school gardening program where maybe some of the elders in town, who are also very much a part of Who's Hungry in America, can come up and they can have an intergenerational after-school gardening program that could fuel the after-school cooking program that might produce snacks for the after school mentoring program. And then maybe you alluded earlier, you were talking about food banks or we were talking about food banks and pantries. Pantries, um, which are the primary distribution point for food bank food, 
um, were developed in the 1960s primarily for able-bodied unemployed people. If you really do any kind of e even cursory look at who is hungry in America and most places, it's working women and elders. And for them, both either the time of day or the weight of the box is a barrier. So I was looking and thinking about that too and thinking, oh, and imagine if those after, that after school cooking club as a fundraiser to, buy, to uh, basically raise enough money to maybe hire an art instructor, a music teacher, the kind of things that have been cut, maybe they could actually do meals to go. So that when working moms came to pick up their kid from the after school program, or the working mom came up to pick up the kid and her or his, his parent who was mentoring, they could get a meal to go. Um, and so that was one of those moments where it's like, boom, let's try that. And it was also because, you know, a lot of food banks were experimenting with kitchens and many cities because of our kind of deft use of media were saying, let's build one of these kitchens in our town. Well, kitchens are expensive to build. And again, my thing is where's something that's already there. In fact, virtually everything, the, the model of a, of a community kitchen is saying, whatever you need, it's already there. There's in virtually every town. In fact, this was a big part of our mantra. Um, everything we use exists where you are. We're taking food our society throws away, people our society undervalues, kitchens that are underutilized, volunteers who wanna make something powerful happen, chefs who will teach but also have jobs, men and women who want off the streets, agencies that want better food, it's all there. I just came along kind of like somebody who said, you know, that old um, uh, formula for E equals MC squared. It's almost as if charity was saying M equals EC squared. And they were trying to make it work. And it's like, dudes, it's all there. It's just the wrong order, the wrong formula. So a lot of times what I do um, is I, I, I consider myself kind of a social chef, you know, in that I'm not, I've never been a chef. I mean, everyone thinks I've been in kitchens all my life. I'm a front of the house man. I'm a show, I'm a, I'm a huckster. I'm a carnival barker. But, you know, the, a big part of what we're doing is saying a chef is someone who comes into your home and says, and you're like so embarrassed. Oh my God, I can't believe I have a chef in my home and I have nothing to eat. This is really embarrassing. And the chef goes in and 20 minutes later his food's coming out. And you're like, how'd you do that? You know, I'm, I can do that with a town. Just like many people think my pantry's bare. Many towns think we're poor, we're behind it. You know, we don't have anything to work with. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You're actually a lot richer than you think. You just need a chef like me to come in and really understand all the things and show you what a feast is waiting for your community. That is, I mean, there are so many deep dives that we can go deeper in, into that. Uh, I really appreciate you sharing that. I've heard some other videos and seen you actually even speak just uh, spontaneously at firehouses and especially during the COVID time um, what great resources there are. So you have these other lenses when you look at the world, it's more of um, not only one of resilience, but it's more of the infrastructure, you know, it's, it's right. also front of the house, but with what exists, with what we're given, how do we, how do we make this work and how do we make it work that, that most people who are middle in the situation sometimes can't even see or well, don't you know, even fully understand. Mark, it's important to acknowledge I'm a white man in America. You know, I, I, I'm not smarter. I just had a lot of doors, the doors that were already open for me. So there are, and again, this goes back to that idea of I am one of many and that idea of reflecting light because I was given um, visibility, um, money, uh, proximity to power that there's groups all around the world that are tons better than I am, but they're never going to get a president of the United States coming not once, but multiple times. Um, they're never going to get these big grants that I got. And that those big grants and that access, and then we started our own social businesses. We were really, I think, one of the very first social enterprises in America, at least of the modern um, iteration. That gave me one of the rarest gifts, which is time, to take a deep breath and, and lift my head up from the urgency of making payroll and keeping the lights on and getting meals out the door. I could thank you know, and that's the rarest gift for somebody in the nonprofit sector. So, A, I acknowledge that gift, but I always try to be as accessible about these ideas and, again, dedicate them all on what's already there. 
Now, you mentioned both you asked earlier about COVID and you just brought this up and it's another fun way to riff because um, I was asked, I live in rural New Mexico now uh, in, a, in a, a place, interesting enough, where some of the earliest agriculture in the, the United, in the United States, not North South America, but just in the continental United States, the three sisters of uh, what we call the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, were really developed in the Puebloan culture here. And it's enough right up the hill for me. I mean, I'm, not, I'm talking like stone's throw is the first mine, M-I-N-E, mine in America where turquoise was mined and they traded. So you got this, this area here where we live has a very ancient pedigree. Uh, but I was asked by the mayor of Santa Fe to offer counsel about food during COVID. Uh, and again, my bag is always, you know, there's the old way, but is there based on these new set of circumstances, is there a, a, a new model we can explore? Um, so I started looking around and I was actually quite interested in the role of convention centers all across America. And I, 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 I told anybody who would listen, if you are in a town, COVID's coming and we don't know what's gonna happen, talk to your mayor about the convention center because you may end up needing the convention center floor to triage patients if the hospital's overwhelmed and underneath are labyrinth kitchens with loading docks for big trucks. So they're ideal. This is where we should look. Um, the convention center here in Santa Fe was open to it, but at the same time, I also went out to the local community college. Now, again, I've always been really interested in community colleges and land grant universities. Because I know while your audience is, is global, one of the things that I think is most interesting about American history is in the late 1800s, um, they developed what, what are called the, um, the land grant universities that were in effect, the first time in the history of the world where people said, let's educate the sons and daughters of farmers. Um, so I've always been intrigued by the state colleges and these places that were built around the ag schools. These were designed primarily to get young students to come in and get the latest science to get um, what was known then as yield per hectare. You know, how do we get all the energy we can out of, out of uh, land? But I started looking at this community college and lo and behold, there was a big kitchen out there. They had a culinary program. And I went out and the Dean could not have been more enthusiastic, but we started talking about the role that the students who had um, left school because the school closed down because of COVID, was there a way to bring them back in? And instead of just volunteers, could we actually give students credit hours that they were now missing because of COVID? Could we in effect re-kickstart the culinary program and bring students back to get credit hours to prepare meals for the community? Well, they were like, boom, yes, we can. And not only that, but um, you know, the Dean said, hey, we have a nursing program. Why don't we give nursing students credit hours to develop the health protocols to keep everybody safe? You know, and hey, there's a big giant greenhouse here. We can flip the switch on that and get the greenhouse students credit hours and they can grow bib lettuce and bok choy and all the things that you might be able to use. So suddenly, boom, there's this new system. But then I became fascinated because I, I'd started to go to fiestas here in New Mexico, which are community meals, you know. And A, I became fascinated by the fact that the traditional meals of New Mexico meals people love here, which are things like green chili stew, pasoli, which is kind of a hominy corn um, thing. Uh, there's so many amazing traditional meals that are actually really affordable and they show respect for indigenous foods. So it's like, wow, this is getting interesting. You know, we can reboot the community college, give students credit hours, which to my knowledge, no one had really done that before. You know, really in incorporated volunteerism less as if you have some spare time, come on over, but really trying to find a way to institutionalize and actually say to culinary programs, not just at the community college, but everywhere in America, instead of focusing exclusively, which if you go to culinary schools, I guarantee you, they pretty much all focus on European fine dining. You know, that's what they aspire to teach students so that they can produce these beautiful meals. Well, now, what you as a generation of chefs who, yeah, they want to learn that, but they want to learn how to be nutritional activists in their community, you know, um, culinary warriors. So, staying at the community college, not only is this a great deal, but this might actually boost the number of people who want to now become chefs because they see a chef isn't necessarily just 
a fancy fine dining person, but a hero, you know, who really is part of, um, you know, a, 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 a community response to COVID. So that idea though of, uh, and it's funny, I'm looking out the window now only because in this tiny little village of 300 where I live, and you mentioned it earlier, there was a, a firehouse and firehouses are interesting, safe places. You know, if you're an addict, you're not afraid of the firehouse. In fact, it's the fire people who come and oftentimes revive you when you overdosed. So they're, they're friendly. I mean, friendly is the wrong word, but they're safe. If you're undocumented, fire people aren't there to bust you. You know, these are, and, and actually, you know, it's, it, they're interesting spots and they're everywhere. So I became fixated in this idea of let's use firehouses as distribution points because fire people are oftentimes associated with public health. And maybe there's a way we can layer meals with COVID tests or a variety of getting free masks or whatnot. So this was another model that I must admit, I'm kind of pushing now. I, I'm really working with a lot of culinary schools to look at their curriculum and see if they can take a little bit of a, of a, of a minor in culinary activism and teach things like the role that food played in Indian independence, where Mahatma Gandhi used table salt to get the British to the negotiating table, where Thomas Clarkston in the late 1700s um, began um, working on abolition and the first modern boycott, the sugar boycott in England, which led to England being the first country to abolish the slave trade. Cesar Chavez used table grapes in California to get migrant workers their basic rights. So the road, you know, the imagine teaching aspiring chefs the role that food has played constantly in social justice movements and helping them understand the role they could play as a new kind of chef in a new world. Well, really, it's they're all essential services. And if they're in the learning phase of, of becoming a chef or in their culinary career, or even, as you said, hospice, nurses, medical assistants, those are, those are all actually should be foundational cornerstone courses you know uh, yeah you can say it's their minor in, in in their degree but they're the basics because uh, if you don't learn those things if you're not able to provide those basics when the hard times come and they and they will come um you you'll be home you won't be an essential worker you won't be one of the ones right. who provides us or 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 you will but you won't have some of those skills or some of those tools in your tool belt that are necessary to really help to have a different view of the world. And so um, one of my earlier careers was, was in medical services, medical industry, uh, and uh, nurse's aid, nurse, uh, 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 and a practitioner, medical assistant, medical aid, and then uh, on to pre-med. And in, in that, entire area, there was always that initial emergency phase, ride-alongs with fire department, with ambulance, with, with those. Same with the food industry, you know, there, you know, there was these basics, you know, you're the sous chef, you're doing the garbage, you're cleaning the plates, you're, there's a basic startup, and then you get to see how do we reduce food waste, how do we do all these services. I think it's a fabulous, in a time of need, where we pivot on a dime and we, we say, yeah, don't cry because you can't go to school anymore. Or you can't continue ed your education. Let's work together with governments, policies, cities, uh, and, and get you back in there delivering those essential services that are needed anyway, um, which build up a community's infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure, long-term uh, sustainable development, actually, uh, to, to keep them going in times like this and need. There, there's a couple other things, and, and uh, I mean, like, like I said in the beginning, we could talk for hours. There's so many things and deep dives that we could go into, but the whole model, so to say, I, I've heard you say it before, was based upon a similar model to FedEx, what FedEx had as, uh, as kind of DC uh, kitchen was based on a FedEx model in, in some respects. And I don't know if over the years it evolved and fine tuned even from that, but you wrote the book begging for change. And I don't know what the subtitle of that is. You can tell us that. Can you tell us a little bit more 
about the business models you use, how you turn, you know, besides what you've already told us in, uh, from your dream to be a, a nightclub owner and how you've kind of applied these different lenses of, of, of running this organization, but also what you wrote about in your book, Begging for Change, which also has to do with the, 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 the bigger food systems and, and what's going on as well. Well, you know, Mark, it's interesting because, you know, as I said earlier, I had time and that gave me a lot to think about. And interesting enough, I also had an interesting sidebar in my career in that uh, in Washington, D.C., the local United Way, which is kind of an aggregate giving system for those in your audience who might not be familiar with the model. Um, it was under um, there was a great um, uh, scandal. And here was an organization that generated almost 90 million dollars a year in donations um, was suddenly tanking. And I had no business um, even, even remotely putting my name in the ring. And I didn't anticipate, but I thought they've given so much to the community there. Somebody has to help. So I wrote up some ideas. And the next thing I know, the phone rang and they were saying, do you want the gig? And I'm like, dude, you know, I didn't get to college. I'm, I'm a bartender who feeds people. You know, I, you, this is a giant, sophisticated machine. It was like, no, we, there's no one else. We need you. So I said, great. Now, in the back of my head, I'm also thinking, oh, my God, they just gave, you know, a nonprofit direct service provider the keys to the biggest fundraising tool in D.C. And this was like in my my thought was every nonprofit in town. It was like I was turning around saying to the gang, oh, my God, they put one of us in charge. Let's go and really turn it around and make it into something that isn't just a pass through but something different. But Mark, they were none of the nonprofits were there. They were all basically trying to keep their own little ship alive. And here was this opportunity that if you got any of them drunk on any given day, this would have been their dream. And here was their dream came true, but they still couldn't let go of that sense of, but if I, if I help you with something bigger, I might lose my thing. And that caused me great frustration. So the book I wrote was that idea of how can the nonprofit sector, why, why do we settle when, for literally begging for change when we should be begging for bigger change, working for change? The whole system was begging for change. So um, the idea was what led us to this point that we're so benign and so um, disjointed and so um, fractured and, and, and fighting each other for crumbs off the table. And that led to a lot of the work I've done around the idea of the role of the nonprofit sector globally in politics. You know, we oftentimes rely on excess money to try and solve problems that are systematic to capitalism writ large. Now, I'm not one of those, let's destroy capitalism, but I do honestly believe we should question some dictates. And I'll give you a classic example of the kind of ideology that I'm thinking about. This is a fun little brain teaser, but in 1986, roughly, the year that um, Bill Gates took Microsoft public, if you had invested $1,000 in Microsoft, you'd have, last time I checked, it was one point something million dollars, that $1,000 investment would have generated. Um, yet, you, um, but if you had given $1,000 in 1986 to Muhammad Yunus, when he was founding the Grameen Bank, which has elevated millions of women primarily out of poverty through micro loans, you really were only eligible for a one-time tax deduction because you gave to a charity. Now, why not tweak the tax code and allow for an annual tax deduction of increasing value based on the same algorithm as a return on investment formula, the dividend, if a nonprofit can show variable, verifiable economic return? And that idea of, of economic return for nonprofits, how many people didn't go to jail, how much food was saved. I mean, there's a whole litany of metrics you could come up with. But imagine what that'd be like if for, the, for a new generation of citizens, workers, activists, if they could attain wealth by investing in community. Imagine how that would hyper incentivize nonprofits to, be, to develop a new set. Instead of just, I fed the poor, it, it incentivizes. It doesn't say you still can't get a, a, a donation for feeding the poor, but you're gonna have a lot more people donating if you find a way to liberate poor people and get them working. That would incentivize the evolution of the sector, 
that would give younger people, instead of having to invest in Wall Street, imagine if they could invest in their hometown and help the nonprofit sector evolve into something a little bit more than what we are, which is in fact kind of a benign charity model. Um, to me, that's, that's business 101. That's just electing a generation of people who aren't burdened by the kind of bifurcated view that dot-com businesses drive the economy while dot-org charities do good deeds. Imagine if you could uh, uh, you know, elect somebody who said, this line is the problem. You know, just as Miles Davis uh, said when, uh, metaphorically said when he released Kind of Blue in 1959, I don't need 12 bar blue structure. My music has no structure. You know, just as Jose Andreas came along and said, um, I don't need a four compartment tray to define a meal in which the main course goes here. Forget the, you know, forget these lines. I've always been interested in that line between, you know, for-profit and non-profit, which I think is artificial and damaging. It's one of the reasons I love social enterprise. Uh, and before we go forward, I just wanted to loop back and talk a little bit about LA Kitchen because I, I based a lot of my work on probability, you know, what's around the bend. So instead of, because I had a big business, I had to, I had to know if I'm going to do 5,000 meals a day and do this thing, I had to know where's the food going to come from because all food, that is in a food bank or pantry. Every morsel represents lost profit. Somebody grew it, somebody manufactured it, somebody cooked it, and they couldn't sell it, so they donated to charity. You can, I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that's not going to last forever. Uh, in fact, you could make a case that the post World War II economy generated massive surplus, which allowed the nonprofit sector to grow from 60,000 to 1.4 million because there was always leftover food, leftover time, leftover money. Well, that era of extra is closing. So you could predict that supply of food was going to do that. But at the same time, I became fascinated by aging, global aging, because nowhere there, there is no place in the world um, that is prepared for this unheard of moment in which people are going to live 5, 10, 15, 20 years longer than their parents or grandparents. It's never happened before. And there's no plan for that. And if you look at savings patterns, you realize, wow, what's coming is um, supply, demand. That's the future. So that, that, that quest for what's the system that's going to allow you to feed more people better food for less money, anticipating who's, who's next in line. Instead of saying, there's a lot of old people coming, make, them stay, you know, make the pantry or the food bank bigger. Again, it's thinking about firehouses, intergenerational after-school mentoring programs. What are ways that you really engage elders? Now, long, long story short is the only way to do this is going to be plant forward. You know, it's not vegetarian or vegan, even though that's a very solid option. It's just saying, let's, let's meet people where they're at. Smaller footprint for the animal protein. So I went to Los Angeles because, that, you know, pretty much unlimited supply of fruits and vegetables that I could experiment with. At the same time, it's one of the greatest concentrations of international flavors in the world, you have the largest concentration of uh, Iranians, Armenians, South Koreans, so many cultures in which you can experiment with their flavors and put stuff together. But you know what happened one day, organically, knock, knock, knock on the door. This young guy was standing there, come on in. He's like, you know, hey, um, I am a medical student down the street. And I'm intrigued because I've read about um, uh, a university program in Tulane, which is a, a, a college in New Orleans, that's culinary medicine. And we really need one here. Can we partner with LA Kitchen to do a culinary medicine program? And I'm like, damn straight you can, let's do it. Now it's interesting because well, they wanted to learn preventative care. And to your point, there's a whole generation, just as there's a generation of chefs who wanna be a different kind of chef, there's also a generation of doctors coming who want to experiment with preventative care, which is going to be diet. And what a great ally in not only helping elders kind of over this kind of carnivorous culture we live in, but just really let's explore what does a new generation of aging look like. But I was also interested because um, we we're getting tons of fruits and vegetables. So we're chopping, we're dicing, we're pure pureeing, juicing, everything you can do. And then we had a big compost pile, right? Now, any chef in your audience knows that, hey, you know, you can make vegetable stock with that, which we did. But given the volume, we could not store that much vegetable stock. So I became interested in super reductions, getting it down to a hyper broth, you know, a super fortified shot. 
And we could do that. But I want I say to the medical students, you know, look, we're dealing with a needle exchange program downtown. And they're like a 30 year old heroin addict. What would be potentially the vegetable fruit ratio combinations formula that would be perfect for that person versus an 80 year old diabetic? And the idea of actually working with medical students to develop broth formulas specifically designed to be like these booster shots. These are the kind of experiments that I dig. And again, it's all, it was all there. And we were just taking it even further down with that idea of like, before we compost it, let's make something more out of it, you know? So again, I, I just, if anybody in the audience is really trying to absorb all this, it's just that idea of a combination of, uh, as Quentin Tarantino says, you know, kind of a view askew. Just tilt your head and try and see your community, see all the things that are there that if you're, if you're just walking down the street, you see them as everyone else does. It's a firehouse, you know, it's a garden, whatever, it's old people. And, you know, tilt your head and see the world differently in all the ways they can fit together. But also that idea of, of radical no waste, you know, uh, it's just when you stop and you think about philanthropy around the globe, you know, what, you, what, we, what, what we really reveal is the deeper hunger there is out there. Um, you've got an army of people um, who, before they die, want to feel like they made a difference in the world. You know, I was a servant to something bigger than myself. I, 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 my life mattered, you know, and, and that's what nonprofits can do is can give people a place where their life can matter. And, you know, there's a traditional way of like, I serve the poor today versus, no, dude, I was part of something fucking much bigger than that. And to me, that's what's out there. That's the energy that is right at our fingertips. So instead of saying, give me money so I can feed the poor, say, you know, give me your time and let us rock this world. Yeah, so again, it's so many words of wisdom and wonderful things that you've, you've presented to us there. I, I want to touch on a couple of them. Um, more so, we're going to put the link to, to your book and where people can get your book and, and, and read it, review it uh, in the show notes and descriptions. So that, that will definitely be there. But before you spoke a little bit about the LA Kitchen and, and the opportunities for everybody, you talked about some division. You also talked about uh, this, this separation, but you also talked about these different cultures and types of foods and different uh, nationalities and global nationalities. And that brings a real unique uh, question that I ask all my guests and I, I wanna see how you tie it together with your, your breadth of experience. How would you feel about a world without divisions, nations, borders, humanity separated one from another as you yourself being part uh, of a global world, a global citizen, so to say, um, <clears throat> especially during this, this past time where not many of us have been global citizens. In some respects, we've been on lockdown, we've been separated, social distancing can kind of confine our borders and, and, and nations and divisions. But um, the pandemic was global citizen. Food's been a global citizen during this time. Air, water, <laughs> breathing's been been global uh, uh, a resource or good, so to say. And species don't don't hold the bounds. So, how would you feel about being a global citizen in a world without divisions and borders and humanity separated one from another? Can you tell us maybe your personal yeah. thoughts or feelings on that? Well, you know, it's funny, man. The other day, somebody posted, a friend of mine on Facebook, it's like, what's a song that never fails to move you, you know? And it's funny, man, because as a young man, the song Imagine, you know, by John Lennon. I mean, I think I was 22 when John was assassinated. Um, and that song never, like, so again, I think those ideas were very deep in my, in my culture. Um, and, and so a lot of when I talked about a nightclub and all, there was this, there were these songs that spoke to a more unified global world that really resonated. So again, that's, that's very, very much baked into what I do. And so I'm always interested in what are the common things we have in common, you know, and food, you know, this is one of the reasons I think Jose and the work with World Central Kitchen has been so well received because um, going back to some of these ideas of charity, oftentimes when America, comes to a disaster zone, we import, we bring food with us. 
and say, oh, we're here to feed you. You know, there's been a typhoon or whatever. And our model was always like, no, no, that actually hurts the local economy. Let's go and let's buy local food and employ local chefs and get them back to work. And so you're, you're meeting the need. And that, I think, globally, people saw a, a, new, a new hunger or a disaster relief model that really challenged the orthodoxy of whether it's FEMA, the Red Cross, and they're all fine groups, but again, a much, a much more interesting model. Um, but dude, that's, that's the thing that interests me. And, you know, going back to um, that moment when I started looking at colleges and universities and high schools and that, that realization that there's an entire generation in there and they're being raised through service. This is probably, Mark, if you really get down to it, dude, probably one of the most interesting social experiments in the history of the world. Um, never before, and this is just in the continental United States where there's 100 million people under 35 who've been raised doing service. I mean, dude, that's a, and to my knowledge, there's never been any kind of research or study. What did we get? I mean, I think my generation was like probably baked in with this idea of, boy, if kids go and volunteer, they'll see how good they got it and they'll be, they'll come home and clean their room. Versus that idea of what happens if even a small percentage of those students say, I want to do something about this, but I don't want to be, I don't want to choose between making money and doing good. I don't want to choose between integrity and a paycheck. I don't want to choose between .com and .org. I want to do it all. And that's social enterprise. So here you have globally, you know, if you add that 100 million here in the United States, but globally, a generation of young people who have a global language of hip hop, they're connected through, you know, their iPhones or whatever, you know, TikTok. There's just so many different ways in which this generation who sadly, I think, are oftentimes kind of mollified by this idea of like, well, your generation next, you know? And it's like, fuck that, your generation now. Our world needs bold, dynamic, new ideas. But more importantly, we need your, your voting power and we need your economic power to challenge. I mean, dude, that's the history of the world. Every generation, it's their right. It's their right to challenge the status quo of the previous generation's ideas. And I just would love to see that younger generation not fall into this trap of I'm going to start a charity versus no, I'm going to run for office and challenge the need for charity politically, or I'm going to start a business. And the way I run my business every day is going to be my philanthropy via the way I, I pay my employees. I give them the day off to vote. I provide health care, the way I source my stuff. You know, all these things speak to a much more powerful response to some of the ills that our generation has faced. You know, I've always said, man, one of the worst failures I've ever seen has been my generation's version of success. You know, it's, I, I bought a lot of stuff, ergo, I should be happy. And I think what you see, in fact, dude, every single morning, every single morning, 10,000 people in the United States turn 70, every day, 10,000 people, and every day for the next 15 years. And you think you could put your head out the window and hear a sigh as 10,000 people look in the mirror and wonder, how did I get so lost? You know, how did I get tricked? How could I have heard Bob Marley? You know, uh, how could I have heard uh, 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 Fugazi or Grace Jones or a thousand others? How could, I have, how could I have seen things and got so tricked into thinking more stuff would make me happy? And to me, that connection between a generation of older people who have so much more to do in their life combined with the energy of a younger generation say, let's try it a new way. Imagine the power if those two generations could find common cause. And to me, that's what food represents. Food to me is the greatest politically or political organizing tool, what be, and I'm Absolutely. ready to get it. Yeah, I, I am too. The hardest question I have for you today really is the burning question, WTF. And it's not the square word that we've all been asking ourselves since the pandemic and all the craziness that's been going on in our world, but it's really the question, Robert, what's the future? Well, again, the future is intergenerational. The future is going back to one of the things that I think is so powerful about where I live in New Mexico is the Puebloan culture in which again, there was that sense and it's almost an agrarian culture in which everybody had a role to play. And somehow we allowed this, this segment to this kind of baked in idea of like, once you pass a certain marker, particularly for women, you have no value anymore. A lot of what I was trying to do throughout my career was saying, isn't it wrong to throw away this tomato because it has a small blemish on it? 
And I could reveal, look at, I can teach somebody to cook and a skill by cutting that little blemish off and look at what's left. But it was, it was, I was trying to also bounce to say, but what about this person? This person has a wrinkle because they're old. Does that mean they're, they have no value? They have the, a, a blemish of incarceration or a bruise of addiction. If we, just as wrong as it is to throw away this piece of food because it has this one cosmetic wrinkle, isn't it equally or doubly or quadruply wrong to waste this human? So I believe the only real future is to redefine aging uh, and give elders a constant ongoing role, one of respect, but also one of opportunity and, and uh, you know, just as everybody's, to, to, so that the, till the day you die, you have an opportunity to work side by side with another generation to make the change you want to see in the world happen today. I love it. The last three questions I have for you today are really for my listeners. They're takeaways for them to empower them, help them, give them advice. If there was one message that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that had the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Well, a, I, you know, as much as I've, it, I haven't played as much a role politically, and I when and I'm a, a global citizen, so I watch what's happening globally as a younger generation desperately tries to hold on to their freedoms and their rights or their future. But that idea of never be afraid to run for office and be be part of politics, it is really truly hard. But policy ultimately is how things get changed. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? If you chase money, you run forever. If you chase results, money comes to you. You know, the last, always take yeah. results. Yeah, exactly. And the last one is really what should young innovators in your field, people who want to start a, a kitchen, who want to do charity or nonprofit, go in this same direction that you have, uh, what should they be thinking about if they're looking for ways to, to make a, a true impact? Well, you know, Gandhi once said, and I'm probably um, uh, paraphrasing, but the oppressed and the oppressor are equally afflicted. We oftentimes in the charity world want to run to heal the oppressed. Heal the oppressor, you know, um, recognize, in fact, you know, I've said in, in my work over the years, I'm not in the nonprofit business. I'm in the bravery business. You know, my job is to make people brave enough to see themselves or the world or their community differently. You know, to help people who say I'm an, I'm an addict or I'm a, I'm a, I've been a, a prisoner, a convict or a criminal in my life. It's like, no, that's what you were. That isn't what you can be. You know, it's brave enough to have people who say, I can't stand next to someone who prays different next to me. You know, I can't work with somebody out of prison. It's like, yeah, yes, you can. And I'll help you there. Uh, or even a politician to say, I've never thought about challenging capitalism through the tax code and maybe incentivizing people to give to charities as a, as a wealth builder. You know, so that idea of bravery, um, don't think of yourself as a charity. Consider yourself, your job is to make people brave. And I think that will allow a, a real, a much richer approach to building a business if you view yourselves as a, a bravery maker, not a, not a charity provider. You've given us some fabulous advice and, and some super tips for my listeners. And that's really all I have for you today, but it's been wonderful. We, like I said, we could talk for hours. Is there anything that you would last message you'd like to depart to my listeners, something that we didn't get to cover here today that's absolutely vital for them to know? Well, again, you know, Mark, hey, thank you very much, brother. It, it's been You're an welcome. honor to spend some time with you today. And this was a really fun conversation. You know, but I would just urge people to believe in themselves, the power, you know, again, I'm a white dude in America. And, and one of the things that's oftentimes overlooked is the confidence you're born with. You know, I can walk in any room, I can do anything. And that's, that's a massive part of what gives white men so much authority is they were born with that sense of confidence. But that's what I'd like to see on this International Women's Day, you know, is that idea of that women have always, you know, again, man, dude, I, I you know, I'm not, I, I don't want to pander, but I'm just so in awe of, of the women in my life and the women I've worked with, the women who have guided me and taught me. Um, and so this is one of the reasons I push so hard on the idea of the nonprofit sector. This is, this is where women have historically been put, 
you know, go do good deeds. And I'd love if this was the birthplace of a new era of the Me Too movement, you know, which I think is, is an ongoing part of women's, you know, decades, centuries, millenniums long march for equality uh, and the role they, they merit through their hard work and determination. So again, sisters in particularly, but everybody believe in yourself, but always be part of something bigger. So your podcast will be number 83. It releases on April 3rd. So it won't be on the day of International Women's Day, which is today, but so that people know why, why we've been talking about it. That is today, uh, Monday, March 8th. And it, it's a historical day. It's an important day. And it's one that needs to be every day. Uh, yeah. uh, so I, yeah, I, was, I was like, okay, we're picking one day to do this. It's actually our world would be a much better place if it was that way, uh, just standard every single day, um, uh, especially for the women that have influenced me in my life. And I know many other powers that, that uh, women, empowered women and girls have to change and draw down and make our world such a beautiful, better place. Um, thank you so much. That's all I have for you. And I really appreciate your time and have a wonderful day, Robert. Thanks, brother. I look forward to our next chat. Take care. I do too. Thanks. Bye-bye.